Chapter 9 May I was in the hospital for a long time. I needed eight skin grafts. The nurses changed my bandages and bathed me in a special steel tub to clean out my wounds. This was a gruesome process, and one medical student even fainted at the sight of me unsheathed. The burns were extensive, covering much of my face, arms, and chest, but they were mostly first and second degree, and I was on enough drugs that if I lay very still, it was bearable. It was the itching as my skin healed that was hard to take. Still, I didn't regret what I had done. I was faceless and bald, but I felt more like myself than I ever had before. I was a new person after the fire. I had performed an exorcism, and Mom was gone. When Dad came to visit me, I was surprised by how much smaller he was than I remembered. He wasn't a giant. He looked old. He came with Aunt Rose and cried while Amanda rubbed his shoulders. Tears streamed down his cheeks and got lost in his beard. I felt tenderly towards him, but he didn't really matter to me anymore. Don't cry, I told him. There's nothing to cry about. Rose fussed around the room, pretending to give us privacy, but when he took my bandaged hand and brought it to his lips, she was on us immediately, gently pulling his mouth away from my hand. That was the only indication I had that Rose knew about what had been going on between Dad and me. Amanda didn't say a word the entire time she was there and I tried not to look at her. I knew it was really over, because Dad had brought all my things from the apartment, including my grandfather's lacquer. My fingers had just healed enough for me to use it, and I held that camera between us. I didn't even check if there was film in it. It was just a way for me to keep him at a distance. Our past and my madness was a sealed-up object now, scary but also beautiful. I wanted to hold it and look at it often, but it had nothing to do with me in the present. After that visit, the camera and I became inseparable. When the hospital finally released me, I went to live with Rose in Long Island. I remember Dad standing across the street on the edge of the sidewalk, a few steps in front of Amanda, waving at us as the nurse helped me into the station wagon. And Rose and her husband loaded in my luggage and the crate with Cronus. I thought Dad must have felt relieved to see me go, though when I printed the pictures from that afternoon, he did not look relieved at all. The relief was all mine. I remember lying across the back seat, taking pictures of the sky blurring up past the window and feeling blank, empty, and light. Amanda. May was delusional. She's still delusional. The things she claimed her father made her do, utter lies. And that she has made a career out of this, out of humiliating us. She was so cowardly, she had to wait until he could no longer defend himself. Well, I'll defend him. I was there. And it wasn't like that at all. Painters use live models all the time. Nobody accuses them of perversion. The creative process is delicate, and geniuses are allowed their eccentricities. I don't mean to sound unfeeling, but for me, the tragedy of his burnt masterwork far surpassed what that girl did to her own face. Dennis blamed himself, unfairly, for the fire. He stopped writing. I offered to be his amanuensis, to help him reconstruct what he had lost, but he was not interested. For weeks afterward, he'd wake up at night coughing, convinced he could smell smoke. Add to that the news of his ex-wife's death, and he was not himself. It was good timing when Bard offered him a teaching position upstate. I was glad to get away from the city, and from his daughters, and even from Rose. I was grateful that she brought Dennis back to me, but after the fire, she behaved strangely. It was noble of her to take in the girls, but she seemed to blame Dennis for what had happened to May. It was odd. This devastating tragedy had befallen him, and his sister did not seem very supportive. When I said something about this, he was quick to snap at me, so I let the matter drop. Their relationship is their business, and, in some sense, the fewer other people he had to rely on, the better for me, since it allowed for the construction of our own newfound closeness. It helped with our fresh start. I told myself he would eventually return to writing, if not to the lost book, then to something else. But after his stroke, this no longer seems possible. It kills me to think of the beautiful novels his daughter has robbed from this world. Edith, 1997. Tickets! A man dressed like a Civil War reenactor in a blue wool suit and cap is standing over my seat. Tickets, please! He barks, then sucks on his nicotine-stained mustache as he waits for me to take the sleeve of Mom's coat out of my mouth and dig through all my pockets. I find the ticket in my shorts. I pass it to him, and he hole punches it, then tucks it above my head under the luggage bin. Tickets! He continues down the aisle and into the next car. Tickets, please! The only other person in this compartment is a woman reading an Us Weekly. I wonder if Mom is riding on a train somewhere right now, too. Naked, wet hair, reading a book. She doesn't read trashy magazines. Could I have been too hard on Dennis? 
Mom is definitely a difficult person to be with sometimes. Even she would agree with that. Why else had she run away from her own life? And yes, she ran away. I don't give a shit what Doreen thinks. What does Doreen know? When has Doreen ever been right? If she's so smart, then why does her husband hate her? If she's so smart and knows everything, then why did she have my mother locked up in that shithole in the first place? All Doreen could talk to me about was funeral arrangements. She was so eager to finally be done with my mom, it didn't even matter to her that mom wasn't dead, that they never found her body. Just hand Doreen a shovel and she would have buried my mom alive, happily. If you see a suspicious package, please notify an agent. Thank you for riding the Long Island Railroad. Doreen and Charlie, my two Judases. I think of Charlie telling me with his struggling fish lips that my B.O. smells like pears. Ugh, how romantic. If I could just hook my fingers in his gills and pull until his eyes popped out. But it wasn't his f -f fault. It was his fault enough. He did something, said something. He spooked her. What had I seen in him? Walking up and down the riverbank, pretending he was looking, just so he could keep fucking me at night. This was him helping me search, you see. Pears. I spit on the floor of the train, rub the puddle in with my toe. I lean back in my seat, and a tangle in my hair rubs unpleasantly against the headrest. I didn't bring a brush. I didn't bring anything. I got on the bus with nothing but mom's coat. I try to comb the knot out of my fingers, but it pulls too much on my scalp. I leave it. When I get to roses, I'll cut it out with scissors. When we were little, mom's depression would lift suddenly. The door to her room would swing open, and there she'd be, looking like a broken arm that just had its cast removed. Stunned, she couldn't stop blinking as she tried to get the house and us back in order. She would spend the day cleaning, giving May and me baths. May's hair she'd be able to brush out, but mine was finer, so the knots had to be cut with scissors. She would let me keep the balls of hair. I would line them up on the windowsill like they were dolls. No matter how long or how dark the depression was, she always emerged. Maybe not exactly the same as before, but close. Why would this time be any different? Am Gansett, thank you for riding the Long Island Railroad. Oh, that's my stop. I looked down at the back of my hand where I'd written it. Am Gansett, yes. I was expecting to see May waiting for me, but the platform is deserted. The air feels heavy and wet. I can smell the ocean. Then, at the end of the platform, I see Rose waving. She's wearing flat shoes on her huge flat feet and a long floral skirt that whips around in the wind. Where's May? I ask once I'm close enough for her to hear me over the wind. She's at the house. She hugs me. I don't know how much you know about her condition. What do you mean, condition? Dennis's girlfriend hadn't mentioned it over the phone, and I haven't talked to May in weeks. Or has it been months? Rose's face starts to twitch. Well, she says, and starts walking to the car so she won't have to look at me. Your sister is doing much better now. She was released from the hospital on Wednesday. Prickling fear. We stop in front of Rose's old sob. Where are your things, she asks. I shrug away the dumb question. Who cares about my things? What happened to May? She gestures for me to get in, but I don't. Something happened? She was hurt? Rose nods, avoiding my eyes. But she's okay? No, Rose says, tapping her key against the car. She's not okay. She set herself on fire. But she's alive, miraculously. We drive down the main street in silence. I feel like I'm waking up from one nightmare into another one. If I fall asleep again, will I be plunged into something even worse? Will it save May? Will it bring back Mom? What am I talking about? I have to stop and get some bread for dinner, Rose says, pulling in front of a bakery with a striped green and white awning. May was almost burned alive, and we are buying bread at a cute bakery. None of this makes sense. My tongue feels dry and too big in my mouth. A fly got in through Rose's window and is buzzing around inside the car. Rose has left the keys in the ignition. I can see her through the plate glass talking to the baker. What if I just took the car and fled? But where? I have nowhere to go. And what would it change? Charlie. After her mother disappeared, it all fell apart. She blamed me for what happened, though it probably couldn't have lasted no matter what I'd done. Edie would have grown up, gone off to college, and become a different person. And yet, even now, thinking about her gives me an erection, as much for her as for youth, for freedom, for love. I imagine what might have been if we kept driving across the country, across the Badlands, the desert, the Grand Canyon, down through Mexico and South America, and then up to Alaska. We could have slept in the bed of the truck under the stars in Texas, or lived on a farm in the Pacific Northwest, or a houseboat in the Florida Keys. 
We could have found a stray dog along the way. An abandoned pit bull, maybe. We could have built a house together by hand. I would have cooked her anything she wanted to eat over an open flame. I would have taken her anywhere she wanted to go. We could have had a kid. Edie would have been so beautiful, pregnant. Soft and round. I could have delivered the baby myself at home. We would have taken the kid with us everywhere as we rode the open rails or sailed the open sea. I would have fucked her into old age. And I never would have gotten tired of it. Edith, 1997. We pull around a circular driveway to a green Victorian house. Rose's husband is sitting on the front porch, waiting for us with a pitcher of iced tea. He pecks Rose on the lips. Edith, he says, extending a hand. Welcome. Welcome to the grounds of Montauk Academy. I'm your Uncle Stuart. It's good to finally meet you. His hand is weirdly soft. How was your trip? He asks and pours me a glass of iced tea. I assume long. Rose told me you took the bus and then the train. I chug the tea, spilling some down my shirt. He passes me a napkin, but I pour myself another glass. I drink it the same way, not stopping for air. Thank you, I say breathlessly and set the empty glass on the wicker table. More, he offers, but I shake my head. We were worried, Stuart says. It's awful, everything that's happened. Uh Uh-huh, I say. I notice he's got a small piece of toilet paper stuck to his cheek. A rusty little splotch. He must have cut himself shaven. He should grow a beard. It would cover his pitted skin. I wonder why Rose never bothered to tell him this. Did you give May the pills I set out? Rose asks him. I did. Is she awake? She was ten minutes ago. You want to go see her now? Rose asks me. It's up the stairs, second door on the left. It takes a moment for my eyes to adjust to the dark foyer. I'm glad Rose hasn't followed me in. The house is quiet, like it's holding its breath. Each step creaks. May! I call from the bottom of the stairs. I'm here. No response. Along the banister are framed photos. Rose in a white dress next to pockmarked Stuart. A blonde boy in a sailor suit. It must be Dennis. Oh, weird. There's one of May and me from when we were very little. May is a baby and I'm holding her. Dennis and Mom's legs are in the shot also. Mom is barefoot. She has such beautiful feet. Why would Rose put this up in her house? What other people have photos of me hanging on their walls? May, I say, once I'm outside her room. Through the closed door, I can smell something strange. May, I say again. It's Edie. Edie, I finally hear her repeat. When I open the door, the smell is overpowering. Greasy and medicinal. It makes my eyes water. It takes me a moment to find May in the room. Lying on the bed, propped up with pillows, wrapped in gauze. She's holding a gun. No, of course not. Why would I think that? It's the barrel of the camera. Click. Click. She takes my picture. I cover my face with my hands. Oh, God, I say. Wait at least till I've showered. I try to act like I'm covering my face from the camera and not from her. I don't want it on film. That moment of horror before I was able to hide it. You look like a mummy, I say, when she finally tilts the camera down. I force my voice to sound light. She doesn't look away or blink, so I try not to either. Her pupils are huge and black. Can I sit? She nods, a tiny movement of her head. I sit on the edge of the bed. I try to breathe through my mouth so I don't have to smell the ointment. Does it hurt? I ask. She shrugs, her gauzed shoulders barely lifting. I can see in the small slots around her eyes and mouth that her skin is pink, shiny, and raw. It must hurt. I don't mind it. I don't know. I take a bit of gauze that hangs loosely from her wrist and rub it between my fingers. Why would you do something like this? I ask her, staring at the gauze in my hand. I had to, May says dreamily. Her voice sounds different and odd. I squint at her lips. It's hard to tell what they look like under the blistering. She barely moves her mouth as she talks. But it was an accident, I say, even though, of course, it wasn't. She looks at me in response with those big, unblinking eyes. Can she even blink anymore? Does she still have eyelids? I wipe my nose with the back of my hand and watch her pick the camera back up. She aims it at the middle of the room. It takes me a moment to see what she's looking at. A speck of dust suspended in a shaft of light. She follows its slow descent through the air, down to the corner of the hooked rug on the floor. We sit for a while in silence. Why are you wearing that coat? She finally asks. I took it. Did they tell you about Mom? I ask. May doesn't seem to have heard me. She's looking down at her camera, fiddling with one of the knobs. It must be hard with her fingers bandaged like they are. She disappeared, I say. She'll turn up, though. You know how she is. 
A knock on the open door. Rose. May aims the camera at her. Rose pulls her lips over her teeth and grimaces. I guess that's supposed to be a smile. Why don't you help me make some lunch? Rose says through that bizarre grin. And we'll let May rest a bit. I've never seen a person so uncomfortable in front of a camera. I stand and the bed creaks under me. I reach to hug May, but I can feel her tense. Her entire body is one raw wound. Rose beckons from the doorway. All right, then, I say, bringing my hands back down to my sides. I'll see you in a bit. And then, as the door is shut almost all the way, I hear May say very quietly, She's gone this time. I can feel it. She's dead. Heat shoots through my face. I put my palm on the door and try to push it open. She's not. You have no idea what you're talking about. You weren't even there. Rose pulls me away from the door. Edie, why are you yelling at her? What is wrong with you? She's high out of her mind on morphine. My mom's not dead, I say to Rose. I might as well be a duck in a children's book. I feel so stupid. Oh, I hate that I'm crying. Yeah, okay, I heard you, Rose says. She opens a door to another one of the rooms. Mine. She stands behind me with her hands on my shoulders as I face away from her, crying. The flowers on the wallpaper blur and melt. I don't care if you don't believe me, I say. I don't not believe you, Edith, but your mom isn't here. We can agree on that. Dead or not, she isn't here. This makes me sob harder, because I know she's right. Mom doesn't want to be found. Mom doesn't want me. And if I had been looking after my sister, like I was supposed to be. Rose lays me down on the brass bed, dries my cheeks and neck with the corner of the crocheted blanket, until I finally calm down. I hiccup. The exhaustion of the last few months descends on me. There's the gray ocean outside the window. Rose's cool fingers linger on my face. She's humming a lullaby. Why did May do that? I ask her. I don't know. She shakes her head. Where's Dennis? I ask her. Why isn't he the one taking care of her? A glimpse of something that she immediately tries to cover. I'm better at taking care of people, I guess. What did he do? What could he have possibly done? He didn't do anything. I know she doesn't believe what she's saying. I give her a shove and she falls off the bed, lands on her hands and knees on the floor like a dog. I turn to face the wall, the red flowers and vines. May. Before the fire, I had assumed Mom and I would always be a closed system. We were like a hall of mirrors. Her creating me, creating her, and so on. Which one of us was real? Which one was the reflection? But then, with the fire, that was all over. When I burned her face off of my face, I killed her in myself, and so it made sense to me that I killed her outside of myself, too. When Edie tried to tell me Mom was still alive, I knew she was lying. Mom was gone. I blamed myself for her death. I suppose I still do, and I've coped with this and everything else by retreating into my camera. The world through the viewfinder was contained and manageable. My Leica became an extension of my new body. I slept with it pressed to my belly, so it was always warm. When Uncle Stuart noticed my interest in photography, he set up a dark room in one of the many spare bathrooms, and as soon as I was well enough, I began spending many hours a day in there. Aside from this, Uncle Stuart and I rarely crossed paths. They took very good care of me, my aunt and uncle. Rose took a leave of absence from work so she could nurse me back to health. Whatever her true feelings about me were, she was dutiful. She was consistent. She cleaned out my wounds, administered my medications, and drove me to endless doctor's appointments. She didn't seem to want anything from me emotionally, for which I was grateful. Unlike poor Edie, whose need for me was bottomless. I'd see her shadow under my door, just standing there, and instead of being kind and asking her to come in, I would pretend to be asleep. She tried so hard. She decorated my room with cutouts from National Geographic when I wasn't yet allowed to leave the house. Iconic photographs of mountains and glaciers, reminders of the wide world outside. Probably reminders she needed more than I did. It's easy to say now that I wish I'd been kinder to my sister, but at the time, I don't think I was capable of it. Our father had just broken my heart, our mother had just killed herself, and I had just set myself on fire. I couldn't afford to be generous. Rose. Stuart and I tried to have children when we first got married, but I wasn't able to conceive. After the girls moved in with us, when Stuart and I would be lying in bed about to go to sleep, I'd ask him, Stuart, do you regret it? not having any children of our own? And he'd say, Rose, what's the sense of regretting something we can't have? But we could have adopted, I'd say. We still can. I imagined my own babies, 
the little Russian, Chinese, and Ethiopian girls. One for each empty bedroom of our huge house. And Stuart, because he didn't like to argue with me, would nod in agreement and go on reading whatever it was he was reading. But we never did adopt. The closest I ever came was Edie. Sometimes I'd pretend she was my own. I'd walk through town with her and take her on errands to show her off, even though Montauk is a small place and our neighbors knew that we didn't have children. It was easy to see myself in Edie, not just in her looks, but in her personal qualities. She was fiercely loyal and independent, but also vulnerable. She was a typical teenager, of course. So slightly surly, not always very good at containing her anger. There were rough patches, but she came out all right. More than all right. I'm very proud of her. It was nice for me to pass on some of myself. Family traditions, family recipes, this sort of thing. It was nice to not feel for once like the broken branch on our family tree. I never experienced these maternal feelings toward her sister. May was just so odd. Stuart reads a lot of biographies. And he says that all great artists have something awful or empty at their core that they need in order to fuel their work. Dolly and Picasso and Emily Dickinson. I don't know if I believe that entirely. Denny was never that way, but I guess it applied for May. She was intense and inaccessible, and she made sure you knew not to get too close. Marianne had no doubt done a number on the girl. I've seen May's films, but I don't believe Denny was capable of doing those things to her. Of course not. Whatever kindness he gave her, she must have misconstrued. But May was a sick and sensitive girl, and he should have taken more care with her. She grew up with that mad woman. Of course she learned to think that left was right and up was down. Oh, it's very sad. I came to her once the movies were at the Whitney and begged her to take them down. I said, I have done so much for you. I have put you through Montauk Academy and then art school. I have taken care of you. I've never asked you before for anything. But this, what you are doing, it's not right. It's not just hurting Denny, it's hurting his family. I begged her, but she didn't care. There was something about her that had always been impenetrable. That didn't change. She'd never been a person you could reason with. I understand completely why Amanda had started that libel suit, but I was very much against it. I knew all it would do was get May's work more attention, and it did. Denny's books ended up getting banned in school libraries in Indiana, and you couldn't go into a hair salon without seeing May on the cover of half a dozen magazines, her face covered by a balaclava, her eyes staring out at you in a way that should have made me angry, but instead only made me feel sorry for her. Edith, 1997. I took one of May's pills this morning. It was Robin's Egg Blue. I hope it was morphine and not an antibiotic. There were so many pills. Who's going to notice one gone? I'm watching Rose chop a carrot with the grace of an architect. May is on a special high-calorie diet for the burns. Lots of meat. Meat makes meat. In the kitchen, there's nothing gooey-limbed or foolish about Rose. Her movements are quick and confident. She sweeps the chopped carrots off the cutting board and into the gumbo pot. The lightness hits me all at once, like I'm floating over the black and white tile floor of the kitchen. I should watch my head on the hanging pots. The clanging, the clatter. Don't fall into the cauldron. Meat, meat, meat. What's so funny? Rose says, smiling, ready to agree and be it on the joke. I shrug and shake my head, nod. I'm not making any sense, so I bend over to tie and untie my shoelaces with the concentration of a stroke victim. When I sit up, the floaty feeling dissipates a little. Rose is still talking. She has asked me a question. Sure, I say. I stick a stray tip of carrot in my mouth, busy myself with chewing it. If I keep letting her talk, I'll figure out eventually what I agreed to. Back to school shopping. This has probably been a fantasy of hers for a long time. Us gals going shopping, matching outfits. That poor woman. Do you want me to peel some garlic? I offer. She passes me three cloves and watches me struggle to get the edge going. It's easier this way. She rolls the garlic with a glass bottle, then passes it back. I did all the cooking growing up, so no one taught me any tricks. The papery shell slips off like magic. Beneath, the clove is shiny and smooth. A little green shoot peeks out from the tip. I feel the pill gently purring in my stomach. Mince it, Rose is saying to me. She trails off. Is she looking at my pupils? Are they giving me away? No, not that. I follow her gaze. May is standing behind me in the doorway. May doesn't lean anymore. She stands stiff and straight. She looks like some Greek mythological creature. Bare human legs, but gauze from the waist up. And always the camera. How are you feeling? Rose says to her. Lunch will be ready in half an hour. I heard back from Dr. Stern. He said he'd squeeze us in tomorrow. 
He's a parent of one of the boys at the academy. That's the only way I was able to get us that appointment. He's the best reconstructive specialist in New York, probably in the world. We're very lucky. May nods. Rose pauses with her knife. I noticed one of your morphine pills was missing. It's not something to mess around with, May. It's highly addictive. You can't just help yourself. I focus on the garlic I'm chopping. I can feel May's eyes on me. If I look up and intercept her disappointment, what's left of this blue pill will disappear completely. I was in a lot of pain, May deadpans. It won't happen again. She photographs the two of us for emphasis. Another person, Uncle Stuart, would probe this. But Rose doesn't want to. She's the kind of person who makes decisions about people, and then any new information is bent around accordingly. It's a nice quality. It will take a lot to get her to finally hate me. The phone rings. It's Mom. She's standing in a phone booth, pressing the receiver to her wet ear. Stuart holds the cordless against his vested chest. His mouth is not quite synced up with the sound. Charlie for you. The words come at a delay. I look down at my garlic and keep mincing it. Something clenches. Nausea. Out of the corner of my eye, I see him holding out the phone to me, but I don't take it. For God's sakes, Rose finally says. Tell him she isn't home. You tell him. Stuart is above playing games. He has an empire to run. He has to get back to the study and set his toy soldiers up in the Battle of Austerlitz. The man is demented. I knocked them all down once, and the next day, they were all set up again just how they were. She doesn't wish to speak with you, Rose is saying into the phone. I go outside and vomit into the azaleas. Dear God, I think. I sound like a horse. And then, dear God. And then just, God, are you watching me do all of this? No, but May is, through the lens of her camera. Neither of us acknowledge that she has lied for me. Take a picture. It'll last longer, I finally say, and wet my hand on the slick grass. May. Rose removed the mirror on the medicine cabinet in my bathroom, so I wouldn't have to look at myself. Of course, she couldn't protect me from all reflective surfaces. In the evening, with the lights on in my room, I would glimpse my bandaged face in the hand-blown glass of the windows, or in the shiny copper pots hanging over the island in the kitchen. Out of curiosity, I asked Rose once to show me what I looked like when she was changing my bandages. She didn't want to. But eventually, she gave me her powder compact. Of course, it was horrifying. It was before the cartilage in my nose was reconstructed, and everything else was still so blistered, red and shiny with the thick ointment. Despite all that, I don't think I thought much about what I saw. There have been times since then when the sight of my bare face has filled me with despair. But that summer, it felt like a small price to pay for my freedom. However disfigured, my face was finally my own. And I liked that it kept people at a distance, I liked this about my camera, too. Looking through the viewfinder, I could never get sucked in emotionally again, as I had with my dad. The world was now flattened and circumscribed. The only times I felt a strong stirring in my chest was when I looked at the ocean. I photographed it constantly, hoping it would eventually lose this power, but also hoping it wouldn't. Rose took me on early morning walks on the beach. She'd hold a parasol over us as I photographed the water curving along the horizon. I wasn't thinking about that first trip to the beach with Dad and Edie. I wasn't thinking about Mom's body at the bottom of the gulf. I wasn't thinking about any of the particulars of my own situation. That it would be a long time before my skin would heal enough for me to go swimming in the salt water, for example. No, I was aware only that the ocean was enormous and that I was very small. It was mostly these photos of the ocean that I printed that summer. I kept all the undeveloped rolls of film in an old straw hat that I recognized from a picture Rose had in the Dad room. In the picture, Dad is sitting on a riverbank, and the straw hat casts a shadow over the top of his face. A cigarette hangs out of the corner of his mouth, and a wisp of smoke curls toward the camera. I believe it was Mom who took the picture. Seeing that younger version of him did not fill me with the same kind of lust that it had before. The hat was just a hat. For a long time, I photographed compulsively, but it wasn't art. When I was getting ready to apply to art schools, I went into the city and met with Rivka, my dad's old girlfriend. She sifted through the stacks of photos, really generic stuff. Blurry photos of the ocean, my cat, my feet. It was kind of her to meet with me and take me seriously. She looked at my work, then looked at me, and finally said, Art is not a shield. It is a knife. You have to bleed. Of course, she was right. I was not letting any of myself into the work. It was not expressing anything. It was just a way of making the world more manageable. I wasn't ready then to bleed. That came later. Rivka.
I saw a video installation in the Whitney Biennial that haunted me for weeks. A dollhouse nightmare, like a modern Hieronymus Bosch, shot on grainy Super 8 film. I watched it and felt immediately transported to a memory that felt like my own, but wasn't. It was the piece everyone was talking about. There was a long, stupid write-up for it in Art in America. The critic understood it to be a metaphor for the Jungian conception of childhood. So bloodless and reductive. The film was not a metaphor. It was personal. And yet I didn't understand how personal until I met the artist in her studio. It was a very hot day, and she wasn't wearing the balaclava that had become her signature. Her skin was thick and clotted, but her grey eyes were so clear and unaffected that it made everything surrounding them look like a mask. I remember wondering if it was all a part of some elaborate performance piece. I remember also that one of her ears was perfectly formed, smooth and intact, not affected at all by the burns. She welcomed me. Rivka, she said, you haven't changed at all. Still ugly as ever. I wasn't offended, not when it was coming out of a face that looked like hers. We caught up for a while. She thanked me for something inspirational I had said to her years ago, which I did not remember saying and which did not really sound like the sort of thing I would say. She was getting ready for an exhibition at LACMA and offered to show me her new work. It didn't use dolls or props like her previous films. She called it the Hat Series. It used old, often damaged pictures she had taken as a kid right after recovering from the fire. The pictures still held the charge of what must have been a very difficult time. The most striking piece was a collage of a room filled with her sister, who was wispy and much sadder looking than I remembered. The sister was included in duplication, sitting at the foot of the bed, lying on the floor, pacing near the door, looking out the window at the ocean, a ghost in a fur coat, circling the viewer. Hunting, I said. Yes, she said. I suppose. Do you have any pictures of your father? I asked. I suddenly had a strong urge to see him as he had been, to remember that time period in my life. No, she said. I don't. Even with her burnt face, it had somehow not occurred to me until then that the films were autobiographical. That gentle Dennis Lomack was the monstrous love object. This was before the televised lawsuit where Dennis was wheeled out, drooling and silent, by that awful woman he married. Edith, 1997. I knock on the door to the darkroom. Spooks, can I come in? Hold on. I hear her banging around, then the click of the lock. She pulls me into the room and quickly locks the door behind me. It takes a moment for my eyes to adjust to the dim red bulb hanging over us. There are trays of liquids set up in the bathtub and an enlarger on a little side table. Cronus is lying in the sink, paws fanned out, watching us. He lacks the cool porcelain against his belly. I rub him behind the ears. Dennis and Amanda are downstairs. Everyone's getting ready to go to the beach, I say. May doesn't seem to hear me. She hits a button on the enlarger, and a square of light appears for a few seconds, then beeps when it shuts off. She takes the blank piece of paper out of the machine and drops it into the first tray in the bathtub. I sit on the toilet. Cronus and I watch her work. She looks like she's in a trance as she rocks the tray back and forth, back and forth. The chemicals smell like vinegar and feet. Suddenly, an eye emerges on the page out of nowhere, then a beak, a seagull. Magic, May says. Each time a picture shows up, she seems delighted, like a little kid. I worry that the fire did something to her brain. Cool, I say. May picks the photo of the bird up with her tongs and watches it drip into the tray, then drops it into the next tray. The eyes always appear first. I wonder why that is. Dennis looks weird, I say, changing the subject. Gaunt, like he lost a bunch of weight. She ignores me. The only thing she ever wants to talk about is the photographic process. She leaves the seagull in the middle tray and takes another print out of the last tray. This is Fixer, she says. After a photo sits in here for a while, it can be exposed to light without getting damaged. It's toxic, though, so I have to be really careful it doesn't go down the drain. Cool, I nod, trying to look interested. It's better than her not talking to me at all, I guess, which is how it was until recently. She takes the dripping paper out of the Fixer and rinses it under the spout, then hangs it up on the clothesline by the blacked-out window. I look over her shoulder at the picture. A gray rectangle. What is that? I ask her. The ocean. I look closer and see some white caps. Waves. The other pictures hanging up look identical. I don't really get it. Why the pictures interest her. Why she takes them over and over. She scratches her arm with the back of the tongs. I think she winces, though it's hard to tell through that ski mask of gauze. Does it itch? Do you want me to tell Rose to apply some more cream? Why don't you go on to the beach without me? she says. My fussing irritates her. In here, I think she forgets for a while about her body, and she doesn't like me reminding her. She's not going to tell me anything I want to know anyway. Hold on, let me just cover the paper so it doesn't get ruined. She puts lids over the chemical trays and hides her paper in a special plastic bag. Go ahead, she says. Do you want me to tell Dennis anything? I try, 
as she gently pushes me out of her dark room and locks the door. I wait on the other side for a response, but all I get is the sound of my own breath and faint voices from downstairs. Okay then, I'll see you later, I say. I pass Dennis on the stairs. He is heading up to see my sister. I crouch out of view. May? May, darling, I hear him say. Maybe we can talk? Can I come in, please? There's something I wanted to tell you. I creep back up the steps and catch sight of him, leaning his forehead against her door. When he sees me, he straightens up. Ready to go to the beach? He asks me. I nod. What did he want to tell her? Nobody tells me anything. See you when we get back, then. He says through the door and follows me back to the kitchen, where Uncle Stuart and Amanda are talking about alumni funds and academic excellence, while Rose is carefully finishing loading up the picnic basket. We file out the back door and down the bluff to the club's private beach. The wind is whipping sand against our legs. The men we pass stare at me, even though the top of my bikini lies flat against my chest. That's something at least one of these rich lobsters, soused at the 4th of July party, has offered to have fixed. When the men realize I'm with this group of middle-aged people that they know, they stop eye-fucking me and wave at Uncle Stuart. Happy Labor Day, they shout. He waves back, but keeps walking. He's trying to keep up with Amanda, who is plodding through the sand like a determined cow. They make quite the pair in their stupid sun hats. Why don't they know they should be embarrassed? Her white back is covered in moles. It's disgusting. I don't understand why Dennis has brought her. He's wearing mirrored sunglasses, so I can't see his eyes. Why is he with that repulsive woman? I am sure somehow that she is responsible for what my sister has done to herself. I slow down at the tiki bar set up on the sand. The bartender is making something with ice cubes and cherries that smells like hairspray. I can imagine sipping it and that pleasant heat spreading through my chest, making this excursion a little more bearable. Club soda, the bartender says. He's wearing a bow tie and a vest, even though it's hot and he's on a beach. Rose had stopped and is looking back at me, waving for me to keep walking. I shake my head at the bartender, though I'm in no rush to catch up with Rose. I don't need a drink now. It's fine. I'll have one later. I'll take a few sips of the wine Rose uses for cooking. Uncle Stewart changed the lock on the wine cellar. We keep walking further, past the people, towards the deserted end of the beach, until we get to the lighthouse. In the sun, its walls are blindingly white. Desert bones, like in the Georgia O'Keeffe paintings mom likes. Is that where she went, maybe? Out west? I squint at the sand, ignoring the ocean for a moment. This is what the desert must be like. I picture mom's head sticking out of the sand. What if I'd almost stepped on her? I have to blink several times to remove the feeling of her face under my foot. Ugh, ick, ick. Can you give me a hand? Dennis is struggling with the beach umbrella in the wind. I hold the top of it as he buries the base. I'm watching Stuart apply globs of sunscreen on Amanda and Rose. Why doesn't it even occur to him to rub it in properly? I can't stand to see it smeared like that on Rose's back. When Dennis is finished burying the umbrella, I go up to her and rub in the white smears. She jumps slightly at my touch, surprised, but then leans in a little too gratefully. Last night, she gave me a bracelet that belonged to her mother. She took me aside and tearfully told me that I was as close to a daughter as she has ever had. The bracelet is nice, thin silver chains held together with a mother-of-pearl clasp, but it seems unfair to May. Not that May cares. The water might be warm enough for a dip. Rose looks at me anxiously, waiting for me to smile back. I do, but I wish she'd stop handing me a knife to cut her with. It's only a matter of time before I'm not able to resist. Stewart offers me the sunblock, but I shake my head. I put some on at the house already. Why don't you put some more on Amanda? Rose opens the basket, takes out a loaf of bread and a Tupperware container full of butter. I'm all set, Amanda says. She arranges her hand casually, flashing a diamond ring at me. They're married? Her and Dennis? And that coy twat thinks I'll ask her about it? I'd rather die. Are you set? I say. I'm sure you could use some more. Maybe nobody has ever told you, but your back is covered in disgusting black moles. It's truly revolting. You should get it checked out by a dermatologist. Amanda snorts and takes a magazine out of her beach bag. What a thing to say, Uncle Stewart says, then looks at Dennis, waiting for him to reprimand me. Of course, Dennis does no such thing. Does anyone want some herring? Rose asks, trying to change the subject. Edith, that's unkind, Uncle Stewart says to me slowly, like I'm an imbecile. He ignores the jar of herring Rose is pushing on him. It's unkind, and you're better than that. Am I? Well, I'm sure skin problems are a sore <laughs> subject for him. Amanda turns the page of the magazine, pretending to be reading it. 
her dumb ring glittering in the sunlight. Behind her, three seagulls land and begin tearing apart an abandoned bagel. One bird manages to hook what's left of it with his beak and take off. The other two are left behind, squawking stupidly. We've talked about this, Stuart is saying to Rose, as if I can't hear him. She needs boundaries and discipline. I stand, and the sand from my lap scatters onto their faces. I'm just concerned about her health is all, I say sweetly, as they blink and spit. Then I walk down to the water. They can play house without me. I'll give them their fresh start. A wave crashes, and the cold foam rushes out over my feet, then sucks the sand from under me. A moment of vertigo, steadied by an arm on my shoulder. Dennis. Want to go for a walk? He says. I shrug, though already we are walking. How are you doing? He asks me. Great, Dennis. I'm doing great. What does he think? Oh, yeah? He says, pulling on my arm, so I'll turn around and face him. May told me everything. I lie. Everything, he repeats. Yeah, so I know. He nods. Know what? What you did. Okay, and what is that? It must have been something horrible. You know, I say. He nods. Is it true? It's probably true. Why would your sister lie? Dennis bends down and picks up a seashell, holds it up to the sky. It's partly translucent in pearly layers. She wouldn't. He throws the shell back in the water. We turn back. I step on a pile of seaweed and the tendrils squish under my feet. I don't know what Dennis did or didn't do, but when I left, May was fine. If I hadn't left, she'd still be fine. I glance at Amanda, who's sitting in the shade of the umbrella. She's pregnant, isn't she? I ask. It seems obvious as soon as I say it. She is, Dennis says. Oh, I say. That's why he's marrying her. So, you're having a baby? That's the hope, yes. He smiles, but I don't smile back. This baby will be his do-over, his second chance. May and I are the first pancake, the shriveled one that gets thrown out. Dennis pulls off his shirt and sunglasses and tosses them inland. Want to take a dip? He asks. His eyes are squinty. His chest hair is gray now. It wasn't gray before. I follow him into the water, still stunned. Oh, it's so cold, so cold. I suck my stomach in, trying to keep it warm as I go in up to my waist. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah. Dennis says of the cold. I take another step, and suddenly the water is pulling me. Moments ago it was flat, but now it's going vertical. A wave is forming in the distance, a big one. I hesitate, taking a step back toward shore, but my knees are waterlocked. Dive under, Dennis shouts. The wave crests above us. Dive! Dennis shouts again before he disappears under the wave while I am frozen. A wall of water comes at me. It hits me in the chest, knocks me down, pulls me underneath. I'm being dragged along the ocean bottom, the sand scraping my back and legs. I'm being buried underwater. I unclench my eyes and see a cloud of sand. Hair. A mother's hair. And then I'm standing again, waist deep, coughing. My top has been knocked sideways. My bottoms are full of sand. My nasal passages are on fire. A mop of seaweed bobs along the surface. Dennis is a few feet away. You all right? He floats towards me. Behind him, I can see another wave beginning to form. And this time, I don't let it hit me. I turn and run, or try to anyway, using my hands as paddles. I can hear the wave breaking behind me, but it doesn't knock me off my feet. Instead, it helps me along, pushing me towards the shore, where Aunt Rose is waiting for me with a towel. Are you all right? She says, wrapping the towel around my shoulders. Snot is streaming over my lips. I'm shivering. She tries to lead me back to our blanket, but I lie down in the hot sand where we're standing. She fusses, a long, heavy pear, an armless goose. She kneels by me, clucks, clucks, gives me a sandwich. I eat it flat on my back without opening my eyes. Every few bites, a grain of sand gristles against my teeth. Part 3 Marianne Physicists say that some particles exist only when they are being watched. An electron that isn't leaping from one orbit to another like a flea, or that isn't being prodded by a scientist, ceases to be. I think this is what happened to me. I ceased to exist. And then I reappeared one day, inside of Ruth Day's gaze. She was a nun without a convent. God told her to leave the order and start a farm. She saw me walking along the highway and pulled over. I found you, she said and I felt found. I can't account for the hole I crawled out of. 
I don't know how much time went by. I'd lost language. I repeated other people's words, but could not form any of my own. Words were just tricks from my tongue, nothing more. There was a pretty name for this condition, this meaningless repetition. Echolalia. Doesn't it sound like a lullaby or a type of bird? There were twelve of us, Ruth Day's apostles, living together on a farm and subsisting mostly on the food we grew. We had morning meditations and afternoon prayers and evening meditations and night rituals. In between, we did things to maintain the farm. We grew chard and spinach and kale and cauliflower and cabbage. We had an apple orchard and we raised sheep and bees. We sold unpasteurized sheep's milk and honey and hammocks and wind chimes at the farmer's market. The land belonged to a mathematician. He lived with us and tended to the honeybees and drew complicated maps on dead leaves, which we gave away to people at the farmer's market when they bought a hammock or a wind chime. Every day the people on the farm would put their hands on me and pray. I'd feel a warmth in my liver, in my spleen, in the bowels in between. This was grace that was moving through me. Eventually, meanings reattached themselves to words. I felt like Adam. I'd watch the herd of sheep and think, Sheep? I'd watch the swarm of bees and think, Bees? I'd go into the barn and look at the tigers and think, Tigers? Poor tigers. We'd bought two tigers from a man in a motel. He'd been unable to care for them. Those tigers had been in hell. Mangy, underfed, hepatitic. They were happy living in the barn. They hunted mice. Little meats, quick heartbeats. We brought them arrow-pierced deer. They liked their food injured but alive. The smell of fear helped aid salivation and promoted digestion. We watched them run in circles for our evening meditations. Their stripes moved like the view outside a train, a wordless incantation. One would catch the other, creep, creep, pounce. Then both would yawn, stretch out their pink, spiny tongues. Once, one escaped and ripped open my ewes and ate the lambs inside. It was spring. For days, he belched wool and passed soft lamb bones in his stool. How I hated him after this. I avoided that side of the farm. Poor cat. Poor cat. I have done things in my desperation that were uglier than that. I try not to dwell on those things. My life is split into before I met Ruth Day. Darkness, misery, and after. Surrender, light. As Marianne, I have hurt and failed many people. I had wanted so desperately to die, and I did. And I was reborn. My problem had been in my units of measurement. Working with the bees, I could see that the hive had a soul, even if the individual bees did not. I was not meant to be a modern person. I have always been a fragment, seeking wholeness in a hole. On the farm, I surrendered. Each of us surrendered and became a stitch on God's mantle, a hair on his head. In the afternoon, we pray by the hives. The bees form a cloud and settle on our faces, hands and feet. Eyes to eyes, so many eyes. Their feet are pinchy as they grip our skin. When they sting, it keeps us present. Ouch, ouch, ouch. We're here, we sing. We're here. We hum our hymns into their roar. Their roar is louder than a tiger's. Their roar enters and purifies us. When we're clean, Ruth Day feeds us honey like a sacrament. Eat his light, not his body, she says. And we fill with God's light. Part 4. Los Angeles, 2012. Edith. I kiss Hugh as he wipes his hands on a dish towel. The guests are all here for my baby shower, but I don't care. I want to crawl inside his mouth. I try to press against him, though I have to do it side saddle because of my belly. He gently pulls away. Hi, he says to someone behind me. I turn around and it's May. Surprise, she says. Oh, it actually worked. You're surprised. May, I am. I'm so happy to see her. She looks so good. She's wearing a blue silk caftan and a veil. Her beautiful eyes are exposed, outlined with coal and blinking like gray buttons. Her eyebrows are painted on, perfect arches. I thought you were only coming next week for LACMA. I lied about the dates, she said. The part of the scarf that covers her mouth is damp, a darker blue. Hugh and I conspired, she steps back. God, you are incredibly pregnant. Let me get a picture, please. Her assistant, Paul, hands her a camera, and she photographs my enormous stomach. It feels like I'm carrying around a pot of stew, I say. One of Hugh's friends, a woman named Agnes, is clinking on a glass, making an announcement about the baby shower games she has organized. 
Each jar is a pureed fruit, she is saying. Taste the baby food. Write down your guess as to what it is on the attached note card. Initial it and pass it along. I couldn't possibly think of anything I would rather do less. I'm going to show May the nursery, I say, as everyone else is sitting down. I pull May into what used to be the guest room and shut the door. Please, take it off, I say, pointing to her veil. It's too hot, and I'll miss your face. Hugh painted the walls pale gray recently, and the smell has lingered. I slide open the window. The parts for the crib Rose got us are leaning against the closet door. We haven't gotten around yet to putting it together. May sits on the edge of the bed and reaches inside her gauzy veil to loosen the inside ties. The room looks nice. She pushes the veil up and flips it over her head. And there's her shy face. Red and uneven, but still, hers. I can't help myself. I descend on her with kisses, smudging her eyeliner. I try to fix it by rubbing it with my thumb. Remember when Mom got annoyed if we kissed her too much? No, May says, laughing. I don't remember trying to kiss her. She'd say, let me kiss you. You don't need to kiss me back. I take her hand and put it on my belly. God, I can't believe you're here. I'm so happy to see you. We sit like that for a minute, quietly. I can hear people laughing in the other room. What's with the geode? She asks, pointing to the huge crystal on the bedside table. Hugh bought it at a prop sale after going to a workshop on energy. I say, touch it. I know she doesn't believe in this stuff, but she puts her free hand on it next to mine. It feels like a rock, she says. Right, I say. That's because it's a rock. We both giggle. I like it, I guess, she says. I pat her bumpy cheek. I wasn't sure until now if I was going to do this. There's something I want to show you, I say. Okay. I go over to the bookshelf and squat down. Hugh's brother seems like he's drunk already, May says, getting up to go look out the window. Jack? <laughs> of course he's drunk. He's a drunk. Hugh's brother is a compartment I prefer to keep closed. Are those parrots? She asks, looking out at the lemon tree. I reach my hand behind Goodnight Moon and grope around. I could have sworn I hid it on this shelf. Probably. There's a flock of wild parrots that flies around. Oh, found it. The Iowa Review, Spring 2010. Can I read you a poem? I ask her. She drops the slats of the blinds back into place with a clink. Squints at the lit mag in my hands. Notices the broken spine, no doubt. Since when do you read poetry? I know what she's asking me. Why haven't you moved on? Just, can I read it? She nods. Sure. She sits back down on the bed, puts her hand on the geode. I scoot back on the floor to lean against the wall, clear my throat. In my life before, I'd stood with my face pressed to a wall, plaster to eye. I did not know that I could turn my head and there'd be space, light, and air. When I wed the wall, white gown and all, I did not know there was a room behind me, with rugs and a window, high ceilings, tables, chairs, a door. I feel triumphant, finally hearing it out loud. Tell me you don't think this sounds like her, I say. But when I look at May, her face looks blank. She thinks I'm crazy. It just seems a little random, she says carefully, petting the geode like it's a cat. Who does it say wrote it? Ruth Day, but I think that's a pen name. The bio is blank. I flip to the back of the magazine to show her the blank space. What makes you think it's her? It sounds like it could be any angsty housewife. It just is. It's her. It's not capitalized, and she uses those ampersands. That seems a little thin. She takes out her phone and types something in, then shows me a Google image search for Ruth Day. A stream of apple-cheeked women. Like she thinks I haven't done that already. It could be any of these Ruths, she says. Wait, there's more, I say. That was just the opening. The poem talks about living on a farm and tigers and beekeeping and all this stuff. Anyway, listen to this part. This is how it ends. Before, there was no day, just night. Driving and pacing, insomniac light, the color of puss trickling out of an ear. Swimmer's ear. My older got it twice a year. Did she even know how to swim? I'm not sure. My younger was scared of the water. My younger was scared of me. I gave her every reason to be. Do I think about my daughters now? Rarely. I avoid raspberries, too. They remind me too much of you two. Arms, thorn-torn. Shirts, baskets. Mouths, rushes of rubies. Her eyes are closed. She opens them and stares at me. I don't know, Edie. She does, too, know. All kids get ear infections and eat raspberries. She's only arguing with me because that's her role. 
I wrote the magazine to try to get in touch with her, but it hasn't gotten me anywhere. Honey, are you ready for the surprise? Everyone's waiting. Hugh leans in through the doorway. I slide the magazine out of view, and May quickly flips her veil back down over her face. Oh, he seems flustered at the sight of May exposed. Can you give us a minute, I ask. Of course. He hesitates, turns around, but doesn't leave. I haven't told Hugh about the poems. Until I know for certain, I don't really want his input. It's not that he wouldn't be supportive. He would. Too supportive. Tidian. I don't like to open my mother up to other people's judgments, even if those judgments aren't inaccurate. So, do you think it's her? I ask May. She stands, straightens out her dress, tightens her veil. I've thought I've seen her places too. I think that's pretty natural. Walking on the street, or going by in a car. I was actually thinking about doing a piece about this. She trails off. This is not really what I'm talking about. Does it help you to believe it's her? She asks. Yes, I say quickly. It does. Hugh leans in through the door again. I don't want to give away too much, he says, but this surprise is time sensitive. Okay, I smile at him, and he helps me up. Out on the deck, our hippie neighbor, Seagull Carl, is playing a tiny organ. There is a large object in the table, a centerpiece covered with a sheet. Even if it's a pile of old shoes under there, I'd be happy. But it won't be. Knowing Hugh, it will be something amazing. Ta-da, Hugh says. And with a flourish and a flick of his wrist, he pulls off the sheet and exposes. What exactly? A jewel? No, better. A block of ice he carved into a sculpture of me holding a baby. We're poised like a Madonna and child. Inside the ice is something pink and yellow. Frozen flowers. Pink carnations and yellow daffodils. Amazing. I lean in so that me and ice me are nose to nose. My head is full of flowers mid-float. I kiss the ice baby on the cheek. Everyone is distorted through the ice, ooh in and on. May gets up and takes a picture. Paul hands her a different lens. Ice, Jack mutters. What an appropriate medium for our Edith. And when nobody responds, he repeats it again, a little louder, but with the same studiedly casual intonation. Hugh ignores his brother. Instead, he tells the story how, right after we met, he went on a trip to India to visit Swami Ishwarananda. Sobriety was new to him, and his future felt too big. The Swami told him to go down to the Ganges River and pray. That river is the embodiment of the Shakti, Hugh says. The primordial cosmic energy, because it's both sacred and destructive. People bathe in it and give birth in it and scatter their dead's ashes in it. I sat by the water and meditated for three days, watched people pray and make offerings, flowers mostly, and by the end of it, I knew what I wanted. As soon as I got back into town, I called Edie and asked her out on a date. And well, the rest is history. He quit drinking years ago, but he's never gotten out of the habit of making toasts. Everyone cheers. I go over and sit on his lap, my belly pressing into the edge of the table. I remember that date. Naked piggyback rides through the house, fucking, swimming in the ocean, more fucking, eating tacos. It lasted two days and ended only when he needed to go to a meeting. I go back and sit next to May. Tilly, sweet Tilly, passes out cupcakes that she and Maria baked for dessert. Is that Tilly Holloway? One of Hugh's friends whispers. Is Tilly Holloway your mother? Agnes asks me. No, I say. She just played her in a movie, but I don't feel like explaining this. She's my boss. I help run her foundation. It's like a king cake, Tilly is saying over the whispers. One lucky one has a little plastic baby inside of it. May's breathing flutters the scarf over her mouth. She sticks the cupcake under her veil and eats it in several greedy bites. You could too swim she says, apropos to nothing, her mouth full of cake. So she does believe me about the poem then. I could. What kind of mother doesn't know this about her child? May turns to Agnes. Can you imagine not knowing if your kid could swim? We haven't started swim lessons yet, Agnes says defensively. I know people say the younger the better, but the chlorine in the pool is so harsh on their skin. You're about to have a baby, May pokes me in the stomach. Tell me, you could imagine doing to it what mom did to us? I look down at the hump. Which part? Any of it. Any of the parts. Everyone is looking down the table at May. Of course not, I say. But that doesn't mean I won't. You won't, May says dismissively, and takes another cupcake. I wish I could be so sure. I look down at the high rises in the distance. They're outlined in a light smog. Or maybe just a fog. I can feel the baby trying to swim inside me, but it has run out of room. Can you imagine every time you try to swim, being stopped by someone else's organs? 
The conversation around us has moved on to the coyotes. Tilly has spotted one up the mountain, watching us from a distance. How do you know it's not a dog? May's assistant asks. The pointy ears. Hugh is telling the story of how, last week, a coyote stood eyeing me through the glass doors, and he'd had to spray it with a fire extinguisher to get it to leave. It's because of the drought, I guess, Tilly says. They're starving and they have nothing to lose. Maria shyly tells the story of how she saw one the other day carrying a cat in its mouth. It was so sad, she says. Jack coughs, coughs, finally spits something out onto his hand, holds it up for everyone to admire. A half-chewed plastic king cake baby. Oh, dear, Tilly says. She and Maria shuffle over to me. We should head out. I'll see you in court tomorrow, I say. Maria will be testifying against her pimp. He threw her off a balcony, and now one of her legs is shorter than the other one. You can't do wrong by doing right, Tilly says. It was a line from her movie that she now uses in real life. It's a nice sentiment. Who knows if it's true? You can't do wrong by doing right, I say back to her. May. There's a lull in the conversation. Several people have left already. And then, odd, the subway rumbling underneath us, except there is no subway. A lemon falls out of the bowl on the table and rolls in an arc at my feet. The neighborhood dogs are barking. One's whining sounds so much like a baby crying that it makes Edie's milk leak. She stands up and laughs, dabs at her dress with a paper towel as the earth shakes under us. And then, just as suddenly, it stops. An earthquake. It's good luck, like rain on a wedding day, Edie says to her tall husband and kisses him wetly. Paul looks very pale. Was that an earthquake? He asks. Don't worry, Edie tells him. That was a 2.0 at most. It's nothing. It's kind of fun. I laugh. Her kind of fun, not Paul's kind of fun. What about the aftershock? Paul asks nervously. He doesn't believe in leaving New York. This is confirming all his suspicions. What about it? Oh, look, the power's out, Edie says. It's true. The porch light is off, but because we're outside, I hadn't noticed. The sky is dimming. What's the word? Gloaming? Edie leans over the side of the deck to yell down at the mountain. Yoo-hoo, blackout. Come get your candles. We have extra. 474 Glen Alban Place. How exciting, she says, turning back to us, all a sparkle. How exciting, the drunk mimics quietly. The others are dispersing, saying their goodbyes. Behind them, Hugh is trying to open the fuse box while holding the flashlight in his teeth. I offer to hold it. Thank you, Hugh says. He wipes the handle on his shirt before passing it to me. I tilt the flashlight left, then right, to look at how the shadows fall in his face. He has a very nice profile. He puts his hand on mine and brings the flashlight level with the circuit breaker. Sorry, I say. I was looking at the sculptural possibilities of your face. He grins at me. Huh, he says. Everything is possible. I don't know what this means, but I like the sentiment. He flips the switches one by one. Let there be light, he announces dramatically, before flipping the last switch. I hear my laugh. It escapes before I can grab it by its tail and pull it back. Dang, he says. Guess not. Must be out in the whole neighborhood. His smile is clean and pure, the smile clearly designated for his wife's sister. He is a domesticated dog through and through. What would it be like, I wonder, to have a husband like that, and a fuse box, and a lemon tree? And now a baby, too. I'd always assumed it would be stifling, a face to the wall, or however Mom put it. But maybe it wouldn't have to be. Maybe this is something I've internalized without questioning. A shard of her left in me that I could pull out. When Hugh is out of earshot, gone to give an elderly neighbor some candles, the drunk reaches for the ice sculpture and breaks off Edie's ear. He drops it in his glass and stirs it with his finger. What? He says to the table, pleased with his own outrageousness. It's just gonna melt. As if this is their cue, the remaining guests scatter to the wind. Jack licks his finger and says to me, your sister and I used to be in love before she met my brother. The earth shakes again, but barely. Just enough to set off the dogs again. I look over at Edie. It's true, she shrugs. Remember when we stole the horses? He tries to grab Edie's hand, but she twists out of reach, stacks the dishes on the table. Yes, she says. I remember. I haven't heard this story. What happened? I ask him. One night, we broke into the stables in Griffith Park and stole two horses, we rode them all the way up to the observatory. I fell off the horse. I'm lucky I didn't break my neck, she says. It helps to be drunk. The drunk says this very earnestly. It does. Your body is looser. You don't resist. 
I think that's just for car accidents. I don't know why I'm arguing this point. With whiplash. Don't engage him, Edie says. Don't get him started. His eyes are shiny. You looked so beautiful lying there in the moonlight. I should have bashed your head in with a rock then and there. Hey, I say, surprised. I realize he's weeping. Jesus Christ, Edie says. Let's go for a walk. Okay, I say to Paul. We'll be back. Will you be all right? Paul blinks several times, looks at the weeping Jack, nods. We walk up the hill. Edie holds her lower back like she's pushing herself forward. I look down between the houses at the darkening city below. The only lights are from cars and fire trucks. The air feels charged. I hear the parrots from the tree take off, circle around and come back, cawing in confusion. Q wants us to move to India for a while. To get you away from Jack? No, she laughs. I don't think so. He just wants to live abroad, have an adventurous life. Do you want to go? I can't. Why not? I ask, even though I know the answer. Edie looks at me and lies. Oh, you know, air pollution, increased rates of asthma and childhood cancers. I don't press her. We're delicate with each other. How long has she been sitting on that poem before she showed it to me? She's so excited that it exists that I don't think she has absorbed what it was saying. Rarely, Edie. Even if it was her, she thinks about us rarely. When I first moved here, Edie says, I'd go on these epically long walks at night when I couldn't sleep. I think of the walks we used to take with Dad. Most nights, I'd pass this pet store on Sunset, and I'd see a man sitting inside, in the dark, with birds perched on his shoulders and legs. What did he look like? I don't know. I could only see his outline. Bald, I think. Not very big. I was so lonely. He was like my loneliness totem. We stop at the overlook, glance down at the moonlit city. Edie pulls a fig off the tree we're standing under and pops it in her mouth. Loneliness blows through me, the whistle of an empty house, I say. Yes, exactly, she says, throwing the stem into the grass. Where's that from? One of Dad's books. She turns to look at me. Have you seen him since the trial? I tried to visit him once, actually, but she was there. She wouldn't let me see him. She's always there, that deranged cunt. You know when I visited them after Thomas was born? She kicked me out of the house. She said I was going to hurt the baby. <laughs> like I would ever. And of course, Dennis just went along with it. He was doing what he had to do, I guess. It comes out acerbic, but isn't it true? He got his fresh start. For a few years, at least. I look up at the moon through the lens of my camera. It looks brighter and sharper, because there's no light pollution. I can see its craters. What he had to do? Edie says, pulling the camera away from my face. She wants me to go places I'm not interested in going. I know you want me to be outraged, I say. I don't want you to be anything, she says disingenuously. I want you to be honest. You talk about it to Marie Claire, but not me. I shrug. I know this hurts her feelings, but I can't talk about it with her. She wants me to see my relationship with Dad the way she does, stripped of any magic. She wants me to see myself as his victim. She thinks admitting this would set me free. There's no use arguing with her because it just makes her angry. Okay, Edie says, lifting up her hands. She'll drop it for now. I wrap my arm around her shoulders, kiss her temple. We walk up the hill in silence. We both hear the thudding footsteps at the same time. A figure rounds the corner and runs past us down the hill. Hey! Edie calls out, but the person doesn't stop. On impulse, I snap a picture. The bright flash goes off, and for a moment, I can make out an adult with a child's backpack. Was he being chased? By a person? By coyotes? And then, I'm blind. I blink, walk, blink, walk into a parked car. Shit! I wait for the stars to pass. Hey! I hear Edie shout down the hill. No answer. Weird, she says, taking my hand. We walk back to the house, slightly dazed. In the living room, Hugh is on his knees in front of the fireplace, stacking wood. The drunk is playing piano. He's not bad, actually. Hugh strikes a wooden match on the grate, and I feel it inside my spine. I step back quickly, bang my legs on the rocking horse I gave them. It creaks as it swings back and forth. Are you all right? Paul asks from the corner. Sure. I sit down next to him, in the chair farthest from the fire. The room glows orange. Edie is on the floor by Hugh, stretching her hands out to the flame. The drunk starts a new song. It's ragtime. Fast fingers. He must be a professional musician. 
On the high notes, he gets ambitious, leans too far, and almost topples, writes himself slowly, and keeps playing. May, you should sing something, Edie says. She's very good, she tells you. Oh, yeah? He turns to look at me. I can't, I say, focusing and unfocusing the camera on the rug. The smoke damaged my lungs. That's horse shit, Edie says. Why would I lie about it? Because you don't want to sing. Well, there you go. Fine, Edie says. I'll sing. That is a threat. As a kid, she was so tone deaf she wasn't allowed to sing in the car. She gets up and sings the entire jingle from the personal injury law firm commercials we used to mock as kids over the ragtime song The Drunk is Playing. But I've been injured on the job, she drawls. How am I going to find a lawyer to get me the settlement that I deserve? I look at her. I said, she says, dancing over to me. How am I going to find a lawyer to get me the settlement that I deserve? Why, it's just as easy as picking up the phone, I finally say. She pulls me up from the chair, and we dance to the piano music. When the song's over, I laugh and clap. I wind easily. I sit down. I can feel Paul staring at me. The drunk starts another song, then gets up abruptly and staggers out of the room. Edie continues dancing by herself, laughing. Edie, Hugh says, and pulls her down, carefully into his lap. Edie, he says. Settle down. They kiss. I close my eyes again and listen to the sound of the logs burning and my sister kissing her husband and my assistant breathing through his mouth. And then I hear it. A knock. A knock on the front door. I open my eyes. Did I imagine that? I think I'm feeling better, Paul announces. Another knock. This time, more definite. Edie hears it too. I got it, Edie says, standing up and smoothing her skirt. If it's people looking for candles, there are more in the hall closet. Hugh calls after her. Edie doesn't seem to have heard him. From where I'm sitting, I can see her profile. She pauses with her hand on the doorknob, and for a moment, she looks 16 again. Her face is open and hopeful, and there, inside of me, stirs that ancient feeling of dread that I thought had been extinguished years ago. This concludes The Deeper the Water, the Uglier the Fish by Katya Apakina. Narrated by Amy Bentley and Roger Wayne. Copyright 2018 by Katya Apakina. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Katya Apakina, care of the Clegg Agency, and was produced in the year 2018 by Tantor Media, Incorporated, a division of recorded books, which holds the copyright thereto. Please visit Tantor.com.